Dear friends, it is uh, a very great pleasure for me to welcome you all to tonight's uh, fully booked uh, event, uh, which will provide an opportunity to engage in the formulation of a feminist foreign policy. And I'm glad to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Swedish government and our valued partner, the German Marshall Fund. My name is Anders, Anders Arnlid. I have the privilege of being the head of the Swedish permanent representation to the European Union here in Brussels. Now, since my government, uh, spearheaded by Foreign Minister Wallström, launched the um, feminist foreign policy in 2014, we have worked hard in the permanent representation uh, to implement it within the various policy areas of the European Union. With uh, its breadth of cooperation covering everything from trade and development to security, EU foreign policy no doubt constitutes a prime vehicle for implementing the, foreign, uh, the, the feminist foreign policy. For me, as a male, upper middle-aged manager, this has been a thrilling experience uh, to see the enthusiasm with which uh, the policy has been brought forward and to come to grips with the substantive, st substantive reasons for why it's so important. Uh, this has been indeed uh, a, a worthwhile and very, very interesting experience. I have learned a lot and so has the entire permanent representation. <laughs> to implement a feminist foreign policy is not an easy task and much work, of course, remains to be done. But I am very encouraged uh, by the concrete results that we have already achieved, including the establishment of a senior advisor for gender in the EEAS. It has also been very inspiring and encouraging to witness the positive response and the interest uh, shown for our f feminist foreign policy here in Brussels, and I think you all uh, are witness uh, and you, be, you, you help us understand the interest uh, uh, that is at hand for this policy. So for that reason, we are extremely happy to have our Minister for Foreign Affairs, Margot Wallström, with us today. We hope, and I'm convinced, that uh, her presentation and the following discussion will not only satisfy some of your curiosity, but also inspire and help us all to advance our common goal of gender equality. With that, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to the German Marshall Fund and Ian Lesser. Please, Ian. Ambassador, thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, let me just add, uh, on behalf of GMF, our, well, first of all, words of thanks to you, Minister, for being with us, but to all of you for joining us uh, today for this discussion. Um, there are many reasons why this is important to all of us and important for GMF in particular. Uh, first, of course, it goes without saying the issues, in fact, that the Minister cares so much about are also issues we should all care uh, deeply about, and I'm proud to say that GMF um, has been at the forefront, we, we think, we believe, uh, in making sure that that's part of our agenda here in Brussels, in Washington, and elsewhere. So that's, that's one reason we're delighted. But the other reason we're delighted, if I can say, is that uh, it's, in fact, part of a long history of GMF cooperation uh, with Swedish institutions and with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in particular. Uh, we do a lot of things together, but almost all of them have the same uh, basic theme, which is a trilateral discussion of issues important to Europe, the United States, and third area or place, whether it's Stockholm China Forum or our India Forum or our work on Turkey. So we do lots of things together. Uh, we look forward to doing more, and it's an opportunity uh, to thank you for that, uh, but also, again, to welcome you and to say, Minister, we look forward to your remarks. And with that, I'm really very pleased to turn it over to my Brussels uh, colleague, Corinna Hurst, uh, who has been leading our work on many, many fronts, including these issues. Uh, Corinna, over to you to start us off and to moderate the conversation. Thanks again. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Ian. 
Also from me, a very warm welcome to you, Minister Malmström, and also to our audience. And before we get started, a couple of housekeeping rules. I've been asked to remind all of you, please turn off your cell phones. Um, I think it's sort of a first sign of generosity and respect that we can pay attention and listen to the upcoming conversations. I also want to welcome our virtual audience because we're live streaming um, tonight's conversation and I'm delighted to be able to spread the word even further beyond this room. And um, I also, I'm sitting next to a tech-savvy minister who blogs and tweets, so I also would encourage all of you to please tweet throughout the conversations and you have uh, the hashtags on both sides of the screen. <laughs> And just a final note on uh, the format, um, the minister will provide some introductory comments and then will join me back here and we can have a conversation with her where she's open to answer questions that we have. So minister, welcome again. Um, it is a great honor to sit here with you tonight and to facilitate this conversation with the Brussels community. Obviously, you need no special uh, introduction. You've lived in Brussels. You've been for a long time in the Swedish government on all sorts of levels, and you've had international posts among them in the UN. However, what I find remarkable about tonight is, and it doesn't ha happen often in the city, is that um, we have a high-level government official from an EU member state um, taking time out of her busy EU schedule to come and talk to a broader Brussels audience and a, co a, co a community about an innovative policy approach and her views on foreign policy. So thank you again for being with us and over to you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much, uh, of course, to uh, uh, the, uh, the German Marshall Fund and uh, Dr. Jan Lesser and also to you Karina, for, for arranging this. Uh, I know you have um, put a lot of, of effort into organizing tonight's events. Um, a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you to, especially to all the men. I can see that you are <laughs> maybe less than 10%, but uh, a feminist foreign policy is not only for women, as you will soon hear. Um, two weeks ago, a little baby girl was born in Bumbu in Congo, Kinshasa. Her mother is also not more than a child, and the delivery took place in a clinic uh, where she shared that experience with uh, many other young girls, actually several of them being raped. I was there to see how UNFPA runs the activities and learned that there is a shortage of, a constant shortage of res resources, money, but also water, medicines, etc., etc., but the love and compassion for, for these uh, poor girls and their children could be felt everywhere. What awaits the newborn? And to me, it was a contrast because the same day, there was a prince born in my home country. And we had the pictures of, of, of that uh, birth uh, uh, in front of our, our eyes. I think that the DRC is um, an illustration of the need for a feminist foreign policy. Why? Because this is how we can report about the situation of, for women and girls in that country. It is extremely difficult. Uh, one can say in short, there is a, a, a very clear patriarchal system, uh, as well as uh, in the rural areas, as in, in the cities, where women and girls have a subordinated uh, position. They are underrepresented, uh, on all positions of power. They have fewer resources. They have, uh, their health is, um, is worse. They have uh, less of education, have access to less of education. They have less influence. And they are exposed to gender-related violence in, um, in much uh, more often than, than boys and men. Uh, the law states that the man is uh, the head of the family uh, and the woman uh, should obey. And this, of course, uh, also has effects on, on girls' and women's r real possibilities to exist and work uh, on the same conditions as men and boys in, in society. Sexual, there has been, over the years, a focus on the sexual violence 
um, against women and girls in the conflict areas in the Eastern DRC, but actually study after study um, shows that men's violence against women also domestically uh, is the most common uh, form of, of uh, gender-based violence. Women's participation in political processes is um, low at all levels. In the national parliament, 9% are women, and uh, as ministers, uh, less than 15%. That is 7 out of 48 ministers. And women who participate in political life are often seen as a bit, you know. Um, so I must say, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. I'm happy that it was, this quote was not uh, entirely unfamiliar to me when, I, when we took office in the new government a bit uh, um, over one and a half years ago. Uh, because when I was asked what we were going to do with the foreign policy, uh, I answered that we are going to pursue a feminist foreign policy. And I must say that that uh, statement was received with a fair um, uh, share of skepticism, but also enthusiasm and interest. And academia now tells us that the feminist foreign policy is considered to be an extremely strong brand. But the feminist foreign policy is more than a brand. Uh, what is important is the realization that um, gender equality is not a women's issue, but a make or break issue. It is a make or break issue in itself, and for peace, security, and sustainable development as a whole. A feminist foreign policy, therefore, defines gender equality also as a peace and security issue. The truth is that oppression, violence, and systematic subordination still mark the daily lives of countless women and girls all over the world. And as you heard, there are examples in every field. One in three women worldwide have experienced physical or sexual violence. Every day, more than 39,000 girls under 18 become child brides. A daunting majority of all countries have at least one legal difference between women and men, limiting women's opportunities. And when I talk about our feminist foreign policy and what it is all about, I try to encapsulate it by referring to the three R's, rights, representation, and resources. And often I, have, I say that it has to start with the fourth R, namely a reality check. So let me give you two examples. We know that the development, Millennium Development Goals helped increase the number of girls that go to school, and that this was seen as one of the major success stories of the MDGs. But the reality is that more than 63 million girls still are out of school and that data suggest that the number is rising and that two-thirds of the 774 million illiterate people in the world are women. We also know that out of 585 peace agreements from 1990 to 2010, only 92 contained references to women and I think only 18 contained references to sexual violence. From 92 to 2011, fewer than 4% of signatories to peace agreements and less than 10% of peace negotiators were women. So feminism is the radical notion that women are human beings. Um, and it is clear that we have to start with the facts uh, if we want to make a difference for the three R's, which I see as follows. Firstly, respect for human rights and the rule of law constitute a starting point for every discussion about gender equality. Ensuring women's rights and access to justice must be seen as central to achieving the overall human rights agenda. Secondly, Women must be represented at all levels in society, in parliament, local authorities, at the negotiating table, in boardrooms, 
and in peacekeeping missions, to name but a few. And thirdly, resources must, de must, must be distributed evenly. And very early on in my term, I asked all our embassies uh, to write reports giving us in Stockholm at the ministry a reality check about the situation in the world and put the gender glasses on. And these reports, I must say, laid the foundation for what we now have since a few months back, an action plan for the Foreign Service on how to work with the feminist foreign policy concretely. And I found exactly what Anders uh, told you. A uh, huge interest and engagement, commitment to this. The plan covers all aspects of foreign policy and it has been incorporated into the Foreign uh, Services Operational Plan and it will be monitored and updated every year, enabling us to follow up on our work, learn from experience and also benefit from consultations on new data. Our action plan also underlines the importance of involving men and boys in advancing gender equality. With these and other measures, we are now assembling the collective force of our bilateral, multilateral, as well as our communicative, communicative tools behind the same objectives and focus areas. These include enhancing the human rights of women and girls in humanitarian um, emergencies, promoting women's economic empowerment, and strengthening the sexual and reproductive rights of girls and young people. So we are focusing on a few areas for this year, and then we will find new priorities, of course, uh, further on. Gender equality is at the core of European values and enshrined within our legal and political framework. And the European Union must lead by example. To be credible, we need to show that there is a link between our in internal and external action and that we apply a gender perspective when we build our organizations, form our negotiating teams, and staff our missions. And together we should ensure that the promotion of gender equality runs through all European Union external action. Uh, European Union development uh, cooperation has since many years um, included a gender perspective. A gender perspective should also be part and parcel of, for example, EU political dialogues with third countries, our neighborhood policy, the Eastern Partnership, our enlargement policy, our trade policy. And the new gender plan for 2016 to 2020 is a breakthrough in EU's work in this area because the plan is ambitious and I think progressive. Maybe some of you are responsible for... Uh, for, for the, that is, is here, congratulations in that case. Close partnership and cooperation between the External Action Service, the Commission and Member States will also be crucial for the European Union to advance gender equality and promote women's and girls' human rights globally. And of course our uh, Vice President and High Representative has an important role in uniting the External Action Service and Commission Services in this effort. Women's and girls' access to rights, representation and resources should also permeate the new EU global strategy on uh, foreign and security policy. This is linked, uh, closely linked to our, our external actions and for this reason we urgently need to address the issue of representation. Within the EU, we would in particular want to see more women in managerial posts, not least at, as heads of delegation and deputies, but also in our missions and in headquarters. The outcome of last year's rotation, where I now I feel as if I'm transferred back to years when I was a commissioner, <laughs> saying exactly the same. Um, the outcome of last year's rotation, where only five out of 35 nominations uh, of heads of delegations where women illustrate that more has to be done. And this is very much a shared responsibility, I also have to say, of member states, institutions, and also civil society. Representation is at the heart also of the women, peace, and security uh, agenda. And the motto is, nothing about them without them. So what was the outcome when we today discussed the situation in Libya? or when we previously discussed Mali, or when we talk about Syria. But the truth is that women are not natural participants in all of these, the peace negotiations or signatories to, 
to a, um, a peace deal. They are not counted on in the process. And they form, in certain cases, they are more than half of the population. So how can you uh, believe that there will be success if you exclude women already from, from the beginning of the peace process? With several drawn-out conflicts, with the continued scourge of terrorism, systematic sexual violence, and today, as you uh, read about uh, and, and get to know more about how, for example, Daesh works, uh, the New York Times called it uh, a theology of rape. So now, in the twisted idea of religion, um, they have transformed this into a very effective, silent, and cheap uh, weapon of, of war. Um, and they do it with religious arguments. So worse than ever, I would say. Um, so, and we also have the largest refu refugee crisis in modern history. It's clear that the international system has failed in its core task to ensure peace and security for all. 16 years since the adoption of UN uh, Security Council um, Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, we can state that the promotion of gender equality and women's participation is not only a matter of women's rights, but also a matter of ensuring peace and security for all. We are currently developing the third Swedish National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security. And one of our top priorities in that new action plan is to promote women's uh, inclusion and meaningful participation in all peace-building processes, and we've taken concrete measures. We have initiated a network of women mediators, uh, with, which within two years will be ready to assist peace efforts wherever they occur. I never again want to hear the argument, but there are no women negotiators or mediators. Yes, there are, and there will be even more. And Sweden is also actively involved in the Nordic Women Mediators Network, and the aim of that is not only to develop our own capabilities, but to cooperate with other women mediation networks from across the globe. As a starting point of the global uh, component of our network, uh, I hosted also a high-level meeting last year where we discussed different measures needed to strengthen women's part participation in peace processes and mediation. And what we learn is that actually when women are there uh, at the table as negotiators or mediators, it will bring more options on the table and also that these peace deals and agreements will last much longer. So we have academic proof that this is the result of it. So can I just finally then mention three areas where I see the potential for strengthening the uh, European Union's work on women, peace and security. Firstly, the EU needs to do its homework. Any international actor working for peace and security that wants to be relevant and efficient in the 21st century has to integrate the women, peace and security agenda in a coherent way. And the recommendations from the global study and the new resolution 2242 give us momentum to move from ad hoc and add on approach and start to include women in all stages of peace building. A gender perspective must be ensured in all strategic planning, an analysis planning and operational work uh, within the, the external action service and the missions and operations carried out under our common security and defense policy. And I don't think we should have to ask every time in the Foreign Affairs Council, so what about uh, women? Are they there in the, in the process? By taking into account the different perspectives of women and men, girls and boys, our operations become much more efficient. It is as simple as that. Secondly, the European Union needs to show leadership. Have I already spoken too long? Okay, I only have one more point. We need to allocate resources and have the right expertise. And we need to build alliances and work together. And we are pleased that the External Action Service last year appointed its first principal advisor on gender and women, peace and security. And we have contributed to the establishment of this position and we will continue to support Ambassador Mara Marinaki in her important job. Is she here? Okay. 
However, we cannot leave her to do all the job herself. The work to promote gender equality and women, peace and security needs to be integrated into the, the, all the work within the external action service and uh, EU's missions and operations. And thirdly, the European Union needs to deliver for women and girls. And Sweden will continue to work with international leaders in promoting women's participation and never lose sight uh, of the important work carried out by women in conflict situations at local level, far from the media attention. Uh, these women deserve our full support and a positive example comes from Colombia where Sweden and the European Union during many years have supported the work of civil society women's organization uh, working for peace in conflict ridden uh, areas long before the peace talks were initiated. Sweden is currently providing support to women's participation in the political negotiations on Syria. And we are doing this in several ways. We have supported the UN Office of the Special Envoys, establishment of a, a, a women's advisory board and a civil society support room in Geneva, milestone efforts to actually broaden the talks. And we are also providing training and logistical support for women in the opposition to be able to influence the process and their delegation to a greater degree. So I have actually had Skype uh, conversations with uh, these women and we also brought them to Stockholm to be able to, you know, form their own agenda and uh, we tried to provide some advice. It was unusual uh, for them to, to uh, gather in this way and try to work uh, together and find a common line, but we were very practical also in the kind of advice we, we gave them. We said, talk for yourselves, don't let anybody else uh, do it. Be uh, focus on the substance and write your own your own agenda, your own demands, and then stick together and be ready for criticism because you will also be attacked, and you just have to know it in advance and prepare for that. So my conclusion: um, uh, change takes time, but change is possible. It is necessary, and it is long overdue. So. As we move forward, I also take strength from Nelson Mandela's words. It always seems impossible until it's done. And I also take strength in the European Union. When it comes to promoting gender equality, I have great expectations as to what we can do when we join forces and build on the expertise, the knowledge and commitment available in the EU institutions and in member states. And I have fond memories of working on these issues also as a commissioner. Gender equality is about rights, democracy, resources and justice, but it is also about reason and efficiency and about peace and security. No sustainable solutions can be achieved if half of the population is excluded from the equation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much um, for your thoughtful, pointed and practical comments. I think only the Swedes can put it so well. You've touched on many themes, but the one sentence that really stuck with me, stuck with me is, this, uh, if I can paraphrase what you said, there's nothing about women without women, because I think it really captures many of um, the issues and the conversations we've, we've, we've had. I would like to use my right as a moderator and ask you uh, a couple of questions and sort of probe you a bit further. Today, you had the Foreign Affairs Council meeting in Iran, Russia, Libya and the Middle East were sort of on the agenda. Um, do you get solidarity uh, from, and support from your European colleagues, the other foreign minister, in pursuing this feminist foreign policy? Yes, I do. I would say I, I absolutely do. But I, I often wait uh, and think maybe somebody else will ask the question today. <laughs> Does it have to be me to ask, so where are the women in the peace negotiations in Libya, for example, or in the new government? How many women will, will there be? Uh, or even when we engage with Russia or when we engage in Ukraine, how do we ensure that humanitarian assistance is um, devised and is um, 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 
managed in such a way that we also ask women what are their needs. Uh, so in every situation, you also have to you have to ask. You have to make sure that you you put that uh, those glasses on to be sure that you find it. And when I went to when I have traveled to Ukraine and met with um, uh, internally displaced uh, people, I met with a, a woman and her, I think it was uh, maybe a younger sister or her daughter, they, they didn't tell. And I could understand that they had been through some really traumatic experiences. But unless you know how to ask, unless mm. you're a specialist in, in tackling those problems, you would never find out about war crimes committed against mm. women. Because who, who, to whom are they going to tell their stories? Or the fact that rapes take place in, in those um, locations where, for example, soldiers gather in train stations, in bus stations, or uh, crossings, border crossings, or what have you, checkpoints. This is where very often uh, these uh, type of, of abuses happen. And unless you ask, you will never know about it even as a, as a problem. And these are also war crimes. So I, I think we just have to make sure that it is it's done um, correctly, and that we have we are prepared ourselves for that kind of those kind of, of tasks. Yeah. Frederica Mogherini, the High Representative of Foreign and Security Policy, as well as the Vice President, is of the European Commission, is leading this cluster of external relations tools and portfolios uh, that the Commission has and includes enlargement and the neighborhood and includes trade. It includes energy, um, the humanitarian assistance and development, which is pretty unique in the sort of new arrangement of, of the Commission. And I was wondering if you have any plans to how to work with this group as an entirety and maybe even use those additional policy areas as, as allies as you're pursuing your Swedish foreign minister, or maybe even there are already linkages and partnerships that um, you've established? I think that there is a, a preparedness or an openness to, to all of this, but it is also a, a practical thing. How do you do it? How do you use it to the full? And, and how do we make sure that we have a kind of checklist also on the things that can be done? Um, so I don't think that there is an, an open resistance in any way. It's just that it is not; it doesn't come naturally to uh, to ask these questions or to design our policies to, in a way that um, helps the women, peace, and security agenda. I hope that Marinaki will help to to do so uh, as well, to uh, to to give advice and to uh, to do some of the practical planning for this. Uh, we will help her to okay. to do so. Well, I think there are many people here in the room who hopefully will also be part of this yeah, sure. uh, journey. Yeah. <laughs> I see some old and new friends. Yeah. One last question. Uh, the field of foreign policy tends to be occupied by elites, um, highly educated people who have traveled the world. And most of them have placed in their positions um, by someone they know or because of the expertise they bring to this portfolio. But most of the decision, decisions that we do in foreign policy um, are affecting people elsewhere. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how do we actually handle feedback and measures of success in foreign policy, and how do we hold us and our foreign policy actions accountable? That's a very clever question, because um, I, I, if, if you think of what happens in Syria, it's a very delicate uh, balancing act at the moment that Safan de Mistura is undertaking to try to bring the, par the parties there uh, back to Geneva. Uh, still, they don't talk directly to each other, so it has to go through, through somebody else, um, but they have arranged for, for them to meet. Um, when, you, when we meet the women, when we have invited the women, they talk about very practical things because the women are, uh, many of them are still there. It's not people that have already left and, and uh, are in some other place in the world, but they are still there. They represent those that can have found pockets where you can live even with a family. So they talk about how do we get electricity? Uh, how do we get uh, water every day of, of the week? Or how could you help us to, to get medicines uh, for, for our kids? So these are 
very, very down-to-earth uh, issues. And I think the minute that you connect these, these women and those who talk about those everyday problems and those that make us human, um, the, the more realistic a peace agreement will, will be as well. And I think this has still to be done mm. because uh, you can talk only about um, airstrikes or you can look at the map and say, well, Daesh controls that area and the regime controls that area and al-Nusra controls that area or whatever. But, but you never get down to the everyday life of the people who struggle on and try to live on. Very often these are the women. Mm. They have to ensure the continuity. Somebody has to take care of the kids. Somebody has to make food. Somebody has to do all of those practical things. And they are very often forgotten in the in that process. And if this sounds naive, it is not. It is just a very, very practical measure that has to be put on, uh, be added to all the other aspects in any peace uh, deal. Mm. Because one day you will have to live up to and implement a peace agreement as well. And who are they to implement it? Uh, so, so this is why it is so important. And I have now started, I would like, maybe somebody here could do this uh, experiment. Take any document and just replace the word uh, men with women. And let's start to talk about men as we do about women and see where it takes us. Um, because that's how we today treat half of, of, of the population. Uh, but, but also we have to make sure that this is seen as and defined as a peace and security issue, not a women's issue. It is not. Mm. It is really about peace and security because we will not have long-lasting uh, peace deals um, if we if we exclude half of the population. I think you just gave a wonderful idea for a thesis or a dissertation yeah, at university. Yeah, I would like somebody that could, I, yeah, could I, translate uh, and yeah. just replace the word uh, uh, replace the word women, yeah. women and men. Yeah. It would be really interesting to see. Very good point. I'd like to open it up uh, and have all of you join our conversation. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question. And if I could ask you that you identify yourself, name and affiliation. And please keep your questions short, um, the more we can engage. There's a one over here and one over here <coughs> and one over here. I, and I think I take three and then you can choose. Yeah. What you, 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 so please, you, go ahead. Is it on? You can hear me? Okay, then. Um, my name is Lena van der Weyden. I'm actually, in the beginning, a, a Swedish diplomat, so of course I agree with everything that Margaret Alström said. <laughs> but I now work for the you EES. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I work for the EES now on Mara Center, so I re regret she, she couldn't, couldn't make it, but I see that many colleagues are here. My question is, uh, I was active in Beijing 20 years ago, and I'm a bit frustrated that we haven't achieved more, that we're still in 2016, <laughs> need to discuss these issues. And I wonder if not um, the key to, to bring forward some more progress would be to engage men to a larger extent. And the reason why I believe so is because when I talk to some of the, ne the negotiators in the, the Colombia process, the FARC guerrilla and the government representatives, they were very proud saying that, yes, we have consulted the women as if they did not understand that I meant that they should be with them around the table. And so I think we need to change the, the mindset of many men that are, come from different cultures than, than we do. And maybe in order to do so, it would be easier if the message comes from a man, maybe even an, an older man. Like we, maybe we could use some old ambassadors to talk to, to men in, in Muslim countries and other ways. Because if, if I say it or if uh, Margot Wallström says it, maybe they will not take it seriously, unfortunately. So maybe we could make use of some wise men. Would that be an idea? Um, yes, and, and the United Nations does, because there is this campaign, he for she, and there are all kinds of attempts. I think it's a matter of how long do we want to wait. And um, secondly, also that um, uh, I, I think we women should be respected for who they are. And also, I don't think we should use retired people, because why is it that only when the generals have retired, 
do they become aware of the necessi necessity of peace? Or when, when men grow older, they understand how much they really love uh, women or respect women. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think it has to happen now. And I, I think without women also fighting for the right to be present at the negotiating table in Colombia, we would not have been where we are. Now, this is a glimpse of hope so far in what happens in Colombia. And now women are there. And that's because the international uh, community, but also women's organizations all over the world, pushed for women to take place at the, at the table, to be represented. So I think the three R's work very well in, in just making sure that we can... But you're right, of course we need wise men everywhere uh, to, to also realize that this is good for everyone. This is good both for men and women and, and children and for peace and security. But there are some great generals, I have to say, also since I worked on sexual violence in conflict, some, some fantastic uh, generals in, in particular who stood up and, uh, and said, enough is enough. Under my watch, this will simply not happen. And this is how I t intend to work on it. So you're right. He for she. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, I am Dr. Nadal Jabouri from Iraq, Baghdad, head of organization and a former MP. Uh, thank you very much for this occasion. Since nobody, uh, I'm going to say something about Iraq short, that uh, then I, uh, I give my question. Uh, you know what happened in Iraq, and uh, so what I'm going to talk is about the displaced women. There is four million displaced inside the country because of ISIS control, and there is uh, uh, around another uh, two and a half million trapped mm. uh, inside uh, the area of ISIS control. So what um, uh, my question is, the EU, since there is a democratic elected government in Baghdad, and uh, there is also a donation through the EU for uh, uh, the humanitarian aids in the country for all these years, and there is an agreement also between the EU and Iraq. When I was uh, in the last uh, uh, parliament, I was uh, in foreign affairs uh, committee. Mm. Uh, but uh, you see the situation, we, uh, the Iraqi women movement have achieved a lot after 2003 and before that. But now there is... Uh, 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 the situation becomes there is more discrim uh, discrimination uh, uh, against women uh, in many levels, on political level and uh, on uh, gender uh, equality, on participation, uh, real participation in the reconciliation and the reforming the government. Even the high committee for, uh, for displaced uh, people, there is no woman in this committee. Hmm. A committee related to displaced, four million more than half of them women, there is no woman in, uh, uh, in it, and there is no, uh, nothing about the personal needs of those displaced women. So my question is, where is the accountability from the EU to the body of the government and the parliament in Iraq, uh, as long as everybody uh, uh, considered is as an, an elected government and elected state, so, and uh, they are taking a good political support, and they have high representation all over the world, and the humanitarian uh, donations. So, where is the accountability for them about uh, their uh, uh, action for sharing the Iraqi women in all, uh, uh, all aspects of political, social, economical? and uh, to fight terrorism in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for that question. And of course, the situation in, in, in Iraq is, uh, is uh, very, very difficult, and especially for those internally displaced. And I've seen it myself visiting Iraq and also trying to... Uh, we, uh, we visited the, the military contribution that we have made also in, 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 um, in helping the, the Peshmerga and... Uh, uh, giving uh, advice and train a training mission that we have. Um, and I, I think, again, that this has to be 
it has to be planned, the questions have to be put, it has to be part of, of the mission, it has to be a natural part of our policies, and we have to ask the, the, the proper questions and get the expertise necessary also to assist women. Uh, it's, it's a very problematic uh, uh, situation for, for women, and, and dangerous. And again, uh, the example of sexual violence, that if you do not have um, staff to, to follow up, to again ask the women what they have been exposed to or give assistance and medical assistance, it is very, very difficult. So I, I think um, this is, uh, constitutes an enormous challenge to, to also the European Union. A lot is done because it is integrated into... I think more and more of humanitarian assistance and we, we have learned over the years and it is also part of development programs but I think uh, it has to be broadened and it has to be deepened the way we, we work on it. So I think you just, you've just given a very strong statement about the need for, for this. Hello, uh, my name is Pauline Massard. I'm with Friends of Europe and Wise Women in International Security. Um, in fact, just today we published an op-ed on uh, inclusive foreign policy making. And my question to you is, how can we truly implement inclusivity at a time where the internal and external boundaries are increasingly blurred and when external events, I mean, be it migration or terrorism or foreign fighters, in fact, impact local dynamics, and when, in fact, we're seeing that the space for civil society and policy making is shrinking. How can we not? I mean, how can we be effective if, if we don't? I, and again, it's, it's kind of ignoring that, that, that half of the, of the world's population are women. Uh, so it's just a matter of, I think that it works as a tool to say, okay, let's look at do they enjoy the same rights and to control that properly. Are they represented? Do they have a voice? Are they around the table? And what about resources? And I think also in the way we are represented around the world as a, um, a member state, but also as the European Union, we can ask the question when we are in a particular country, we can say, so what about the women ministry? Um, can we give resources to them? How are they equipped? Uh, or ask the minister for women affairs, who often, you know, is a junior minister that has absolutely no power, and we can ask for her to, to be present. We can lift them up, we can make them visible, we can make them important, and we can do it consistently to make sure that this is uh, integrated, and to direct our own resources also to build that capacity. So I think it has to go very deep into the structures to, to achieve a real change also in the way, in the status of, of women and in the status of working on these issues. So, so that's among the things we, we can do, definitely. I remember an example from one of the EU projects. I've, I've mentioned this to some of you before, because they said, okay, okay, this gender budgeting and what have you, this sounds so, so strange. And, you know, we were building a bridge. So how can you have a gender perspective of, on building a bridge? Yes, because when they asked women, I think this was in Sri Lanka, they asked women, so what about this bridge? And they said, okay, men own the cars. We walk or we have a bike. And, and that's why you should make sure that we can actually use the bridge. This would, that would not come naturally. Unless you had asked the women, there would not have been a space for, for those who, who walk or, or use a bicycle or uh, otherwise uh, have to, to uh, travel on that uh, bridge. So you could actually find a gender perspective even on that uh, looked like a technical, what looked like a very technical issue. So I, I think you just have to ask sometimes, and you have to make sure that you take that into account. Um, my name is Paul Adamson, um, Foreign Secretary. Um, you rightly said in your opening remarks the focus should be maybe on having more women mediators, negotiators, ambassadors, uh, foreign secretaries like yourself, foreign ministers like yourself. Uh, Do you know how many we are in the in the Foreign Affairs Council? Two. <laughs> yeah, three. Three, okay. 
Uh, but you also said in response to the first question uh, that we, we just can't wait because waiting for these people to break out, women to become uh, negotiators may take quite some time, unfortunately. So my, my question, suggestion to you is, do you have a strategy or a plan in the, in the short, immediate term to sensitize men who still occupy too many of these positions so they are more aware of this feminist foreign policy? Obviously, you want to have more women in, in, in these key positions, but in the meantime, you have to make, find a way to, to get men more sensitive to what you're trying to achieve. And how would you go about that? I, th I think we, sometimes I think one has to put a price tag on it, like uh, Sir Nicholas Stern did with, uh, with the climate change. Um, you need to say that this will cost you, unless you use also uh, all the women, unless you are more, you use the potential of all the women, you will lose out, you will lose money, you will lose uh, uh, resources, you will use, uh, lose a, f a future if you don't uh, fully... Uh, accept it, but I really don't know what sensitizing is. I, I, you know, because men will fear that they will be thrown out; they will be actually replaced by some women, um, and um, it is it feels threatening uh, to, to them. Um, and it used to be like that in our countries as as well. We, we, when we were in the DRC, and not that I want to single out DRC; I mean, it's just one illustration of it. But they had a fantastic project um, that were called the Co-Men, or the Congo Congolese Men's Network, and they they played a little a theater for us. So, of course, the and this is the situation in many of the villages. The woman carries firewood on her head. She has a child. Uh, she, she has a, a child, she had, uh, has a child by her hand, and she carries water as well. Uh, and, uh, and the man, well, he had a machete, uh, that's, that's true, but that's <laughs> what he carried, um, accompanying the, the woman. And then they meet another couple that uh, then finally convinced them that they can share uh, very differently. And it was not that long ago that we had the same situation in our countries, and I remember my father thinking that that was a woman's work. Everything in the home was for the woman and for, for my mother. So it, it has taken um, a couple of generations to change that also in our, our countries. But I, I think it, ha it has to be rational. You have to understand that it will not be a long-lasting peace also in countries like Libya right now. The situation that, that are on our desk in the Foreign Affairs Council uh, will be better solved if you engage women from the very beginning. What do you think, Paul? What could we do? What will convince men otherwise? Well, I, was, I was actually thinking of um, sensitizing men in the West, actually, because what, maybe what you're coming across, you keep talking about the Foreign Affairs Council and, and the same applies to NATO as well, is how to, you know, is how to um, go beyond the kind of the, the snobbishness and the arrogance of men in these in these gatherings on the west side because uh, it, it maybe is that possible? Well, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm joking. Well, I think all the men in this room almost by definition will support you. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here wasting our time. We'd be doing some stupid men thing like watching football and drinking beer. That of course men do, right? Apparently, um, but no, seriously, I think you should start start here in the Foreign Affairs Council, in NATO, in the Political Security Committee. Uh, uh, Committee um, in getting uh, the fantastic group that, that Karina chairs, Women in International Security, to to major on on getting men to be more uh, aware of what you're doing. And you can do two the two keen, rather crass approaches. One is the kind of naming and shaming that we discussed in another for in the past, uh, Foreign Secretary. But also just by doing with humour, just trying to embarrass men into. You know, humor is a great, powerful tool, and just embarrass us men into being a bit more savvy in, 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 the, in the feminine discussion in foreign policy. I think it would be more effective than bringing the economic arguments. Well, no, it's, all, it's neither, no, it's not a zero sum. Whatever, whatever works, uh, foreign minister, whatever works. Well, I believe in quotas, I'll tell you. I believe in quotas. I don't think that that's unfair in any way. I think, on the contrary, this is just to correct um, uh, discrimination against women uh, right now. So I think it's a very effective and good tool that we could use. So I think we should decide on some quotas at uh, different levels. And that will help women to establish. And they are wise enough to say, well, I won't take this unless I feel that I qu I'm qualified enough to, to do it. There are enough qualified women to actually be able to correct the, the misrepresentation of women. Uh, and the unfair uh, representation that we have to do. 
Our former over here, but I also encourage other men to ask a question, so Paul is not the only one. We have one here, one in the back, and then one in the front. Yes, sir. Talk close. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Barbara Helfrich. I am uh, from uh, the first European feminist think tank in Brussels, uh, G5, Gender 5 Plus. And I have um, a couple of questions, two questions only. But first of all, I would like to thank you for a very daring foreign policy, a feminist foreign policy is great. So hopefully other governments will take up the cue and, and, uh, and emulate what is really Canada true. has already. Have you noticed? I'm talking, I'm talking <laughs> European Union. Yeah. No, okay. no, no, I, I, come, I come back to Canada because that's an in interesting case. Um, I think uh, foreign policy is a tricky issue because we are trying to tell other countries uh, and do, uh, make other countries do something that we don't do ourselves. And, and here again, Canada comes in, in, into play because if you look at the reasons for asylum seeking, uh, and one of the reasons is gender-based violence, and Canada was one of the first countries to give asylum to women who had been exposed or had experienced gender-based violence. And to me, it seems important that the EU, as the EU, also advances on that issue. I know Sweden has an immigration law based where gender-based violence is a reason for asylum seeking. That's, so that's one question. What could, could we do in order to promote that uh, that, that, that kind of legislation at European level. Secondly, um, I just read this morning the, the New York Times and I looked at South Sudan and the situation is a tremendous situation in particular in terms of uh, the rapes that are being perpetrated uh, again, and, and again and again from both sides, the newers and, and the governmental side. Uh, concretely, what can you, what could the EU do to address the specific issue of gender-based violence? And finally, the migrants and the migration crisis. Uh, I've looked at the, the, the existing policies and there's very little on gender-based or gen a gender policy towards migration. And I was wondering mm -hmm. in the discussion on migration that you must have had, was there a mention of a gender perspective in these <coughs> discussions? Thanks. Mm. Well, good and, and very difficult questions. So to start with the migration or the, the refugee crisis, I think that what happened was that there came so many people, uh, and I must say uh, half unexpectedly, we never expected so many to come, for example, to our country. Uh, and at first we did not even have a chance to interview those who came to uh, get their stories and to place them properly, but we had to find shelter, we had some, to find somewhere for them to, to, to stay. And only now, and especially since we had, uh, we received 30% of all the unaccompanied children who came to, to Sweden, uh, this was just an overwhelming task. From 400 of these unaccompanied children every year to 35,000 in one year, in 2015. And it became untenable. We could not. We simply could not continue like that. We had to say stop because it was not right to the kids. Also, we we did, we could not handle the the situation. The social services could not, and so on. And this is a responsibility that is not only we cannot tell them, you know, uh, get a haircut and job and find somewhere to live yourself. But but these were children, and we had to provide schools and somewhere to live and uh, look after them properly. So I think. This is also one aspect of interviewing women or knowing um, uh, how, to, um, how to deal with that and follow, follow up on that. We have not done enough. Now we are slowly catching up, getting the, uh, the expertise and, and all of the people who can do it. But uh, I think we've been very slow and we have not shared enough of, of experiences and best practices in the field either. So I think that's, that still has, that remains to be done. And we hear of rapes and we hear of, of all of these problems as, as well. And uh, we are not effective enough. We are struggling and we've started, but, uh, but not enough, definitely. And um, um, I, I, I believe that in many of these, the, those policies that we have, it, is, it must be a much more, um, um, it must be a, a, a carved out, a policy that is more carved out. I think we now have the, 
the instruments necessary. We have naming and shaming from from the UN resolutions that, that give us a chance to do naming and shaming, to actually list all the perpetrators, to to do um, uh, women advisors, and the European Union should do the same. We should have exactly the, the same system also in our uh, in our um, uh, missions and uh, and presence. And South Sudan is just it's so horrible. You you get nightmares from from uh, reading about uh, and hearing about the, the the stories. And it is as if it brutalizes the society to such an extent when sexual violence is being used. And it, it, it becomes a heavy impediment to restore peace in any country that has been through such a situation where so thousands and thousands of women, and it affects not only them, but their kids and the whole society. And very often it's combined with, uh, you know, severing the, the, the bonds between family members. So they force a, a boy to rape a mother or sister and then kill them. And then they say, well, you see, you don't have any family anymore. We are your new family, so you join us, uh, a rebel group or what have you. And as if all the violence built in and the brutality that comes from a war situation has to be taken out on women. So they are always the subject uh, of, uh, of the worst of, of abuse. And the thing is, we live with these three misconceptions of, of uh, sexual violence still. First of all, that it is unavoidable that it is inevitable because it has been there in war and conflict uh, since the beginning of history. Secondly, that it is shameful, that because it has to do with sexuality, people think. It has to do with power, with the sexual expression, not the other way around. But they think it is a bit uh, shameful, so it, should, uh, it, it is unspeakable. And the third is that it is looked at as a lesser crime. But my God, we have, people are getting killed and tortured, and then you talk about rape. What is a rape? So, so these are the misconceptions about sexual violence that we have to deal with constantly. So more information and more using fully the instruments we have. Thank you. There's one in the back and then one in the front. Thank you. Um, my name is Olivia Lazard. I work as an independent consultant on impact evaluations in conflict zones. I've worked a lot on various projects in DRC amongst um, the countries that you have counted um, and for Swedish funded projects. Um, I was quite happy to hear you mentioning DRC because I've been there quite a bit over the past couple of years and I've heard countless stories of women who have been through sexual and sexist violence. And it is still very shocking to me to hear how much they are um, at a loss within a system that deserves completely their interests and their protection. As an impact evaluator, my job is to try and make sure that um, anybody who works in the aid and development sector improve and professionalize at their methods and the work that they do. And one of the conclusions that I always come to when it comes to evaluating stabilization projects or peace building projects is the fact that there is very little cooperation at the field level between technical agencies, internally within the technical agencies of different countries, but also amongst the technical agencies of various countries. I find your policy, as it was mentioned, very daring, and at last it has come. And I have a request. I would like for your policy to include as a pillar a notion of cooperation at the field level um, which will facilitate having a feminist proactive policy, as you were saying, as a hands-on and very progressive policy towards protecting women and making them agents of change, but also as a way to mainstream it within any development, peacebuilding and aid project in conflict zones particularly. Um, I believe that if this does not happen, women will keep on falling through the cracks of a system that is not working because agencies keep on working in silos. We need to move towards a more holistic approach. So that was a request. I have another question. The question is, you mentioned um, that 
you are supporting the creation of a network for women mediators. And I was wondering if you can expand a bit on that and explain a bit about the model. Thank you very much. Good. You're, I think, well spoken. I'll, I'll take that immediately to heart. And I think you're absolutely right. And I've seen it myself also when I was a special representative, how you know, we, very often we were the first one to, to bring them together sometimes. They did not meet regularly. So, of course, it was uh, double work. It has to do also with the system for humanitarian assistance. And I think this is... Uh, this, I, I was on the panel later on that worked on humanitarian assistance, and I think we have proposed a few things that will help also this uh, um, uh, to avoid this compartmentalization of, of humanitarian assistance and other, other assistance. So I, I take your, your proposal to, to heart immediately. Um, we, are, we have identified a, a long list of, of excellent women, professional, uh, highly skilled uh, women, there are some ambassadors or uh, ex-ambassadors, retired people who uh, can be used for, for this particular uh, thing. And we train them through the Bol Folke Bernadotte Academy uh, to make sure that they can, can get the best uh, training also that there is. I think some of them can start immediately to, to be on, uh, on teams, negotiating teams. Um, and so we, we have... It's just a matter of looking at where are they to find them and then start to do the, the training and then link them up. And we've said, why not uh, get also connected to African networks of uh, women mediators? And uh, it's good because um, I think they are still missing. I know the United Nations is trying to do better. And I think the EU should also uh, work on, on these issues more. Last question in the front, and then we'll close. I think you have. Hi, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it's always great to hear you speak. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm working for the European Institute of Peace. Um, I want to go back to uh, what you said about Syria in particular. And um, I think that you emphasize a very important point when it comes to also reconnecting with local peace builders. Um, I think working on these issues, we see a huge gap between local peace processes and international peace processes. Um, so going back to Syria, I'm sure you're aware of the study published by Kifina Tikfina and uh, Bada a couple of months ago. And it's quite striking going through that report to find that there are, I believe, about 60 women's organizations inside Syria mm. working still. Um, I think you've done a tremendous job in bringing a Syrian women delegation um, to support the Syrian opposition. But my question is, what can be done to, first of all, bridge um, international peace processes and local peace processes? And is it possible to think more creatively um, about how we can uh, we know that with increasing violence, it becomes increasingly difficult to move, and particularly for women. How can we connect with those women that actually can't move outside um, the country, for instance, mm -hmm. in the case of Syria? Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, I, I think in Syria and other places uh, like that, where, where there is war and conflict, we just have to make sure that their needs are, that they are <laughs> able to express their needs, um, that it is clearly defined and that we provide all the help and, uh, and assistance and uh, it was interesting also for me to try to to think of what am I going to say to them I mean I don't know anything about the life I can only see from the television or from reports that I that I read but what do I know about their their reality I can only give them some advice on, on how to do how to organize themselves because this is new to them democracy has not been been part of their uh, their their DNA, but um, to help them on very practical things, and um, I just think we have to in all of these peace processes we have to ask people, we have to engage people, and we have to let them have a, a voice and a platform and and a place to express their needs. But I can also see, I mean, I I re just read you know Twitter comments and on Facebook, and they, at home they scorn me a lot. Yeah, 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 go to Russia with those plans, or they try to do, you know, this feminist, they think it's ridiculous, they think it is, you know, so, of course they don't understand uh, what it is, and, and how it is a peace and security issue, but 
But there has been a lot of resistance if you want to, to start. And I don't have all the answers. I mean, we are only exploring how to be consistent in, in our foreign uh, policy as well. How do we do it? What are the best methods? And, and to, be, to make sure that we come in as early as possible in the process. Um, that's really the trick, I, th I think. And then women, they don't want to be victims. They want to be actors and uh, fully members of their societies, proud members of society, capable. Thank you, Minister Vatsum, for your generous time and commitment to this cause. Um, you've brought to tonight sort of reason on the one side, but also compassion. And I think the wealth of topics that were brought up by your comments and foreign policy also shows how interconnected all of that is. And I hope that all of us sort of will be able to take some inspiration with us tonight and put it into action tomorrow morning when we return to our desks. And think of Nadia Murad, who came to see me, and she, she escaped from uh, ISIL or from Daesh. And uh, this young uh, uh, woman, she... Her whole family was butchered. They, they were killed and uh, taken away. She and her sisters were taken away. And they were then handed out to the soldiers. And she said, you know, they, th th these are really unspeakable things that happened to me. And they were so terrible, I wanted to kill myself. And when I could not, um, uh, and then I was handed over to another uh, soldier, I knew I had to escape. I had to save my, my own life. And, and when girls can do that, when they can survive and they can still have a voice and, and stand up, and I, we told her, you know, your honor has not been touched by this. You have your full honor, but it is the perpetrators that we have to go after. And that is really um, something that must inspire all of us. They, they do survive. They get out, they, they escape, they pick up the pieces of their lives and they continue. And they take responsibility not only for themselves, but also for their kids and for their families and for their societies. Those are the most inspiring people. That's what I think. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Also. <laughs> for contributing and let's hope we can continue uh, the message and a warm uh, thank you also to the Swedish representation who helped us put this together and onwards. Thank onwards. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you think that we close to us?